Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DI 101 webinar series. My name is Jared Evans, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Top Build's family of companies, including Distribution International. If you are new to the DI 101 webinar series, I'll tell you that it is an incredible resource offered to DI customers, partners, and associates. By partnering with our manufacturers and our industry experts, these webinars deliver informative presentations about industry trends, new technology, new products, and product applications. In order to fully support our customers, Distribution International offers products and solutions from multiple manufacturers and brands in many different product categories. This webinar does not represent an endorsement of one manufacturer or brand over another. We pride ourselves in partnering with manufacturers that deliver products of the highest quality to our customers. We're extremely excited to welcome our strategic manufacturing partner, Rockwool, for today's webinar presentation about stone wool insulation with solutions to maximize plant safety. Our presenter today is Jack Blundell. He's the technical sales manager for Rockwool Technical Insulation. He's based in Houston, Texas, and brings more than 13 years of experience in the insulation industry, providing solutions to facilities such as refineries, petrochemical, and power plants. We're proud to have Rockwool present today, and we thank them for their time. We will field questions at the end of the webinar. To submit questions, please use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will answer the questions at the end. Uh, so without further delay, I will turn this over to Jack Blundell with Rockwool. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jared. I really appreciate the, you know, the kind introduction and, and the support really from the DI uh, organization. I personally think DI has really has done a fantastic job putting together these educational, you know, one-on-one webinar series events. I mean, for me and, and a lot of other folks, they're always very helpful. So my hope uh, today is that I'll continue the trend in providing valuable information and just a warm welcome to everyone that has dialed in. As mentioned, my name is Jack Lindell. Uh, I'm the technical sales manager for Rockwool based out of Houston, Texas, and just very happy that uh, y'all could join us uh, for a bit today. You know, Rockwell's goal with this uh, presentation is to educate uh, specifically how water, fire, and noise present critical challenges and risks to many industrial facilities. You know, there are some recent uh, innovative advancements uh, by Rockwell Technical Insulation that have improved stonewall insulation to meet, you know, critical design criteria, uh, particularly in, in terms of safety. So, this presentation aims to provide you know, some insights that will showcase uh, the latest improvements in Stonewall and how it can uh, enhance both personal and implant safety. So to start, uh, I guess just a little bit about uh, you know, Rockwell as, as an organization for those that are not as familiar with us. Um, and then I want to provide some information on why water repellency is critical for industrial insulation systems and really highlight the challenge of water ingress and how it leads to uh, corrosion under insulation. And from there, understanding what hydrocarbon fires are in industrial plants and how passive fire protection minimizes the dangers of these aggressive fires. And additionally, uh, just how a properly designed and specified insulation system can help with uh, industrial plant noise challenges. And Within each of these topics, just looking at what what are Rockwell's specific solutions that protect from the water, fire, uh, and noise. And finally, I just I thought it'd be important to just share some of the key, I guess, company developments that Rockwell has taken to emphasize our commitment, uh, you know, to this very important and growing uh, industrial insulation landscape uh, in North America. I guess for those that may not be as familiar with uh, who we are, just real quickly, just wanna talk, uh, first of all, who Rockwell is as a global uh, insulation company. So the Rockwell Group is the world's leading uh, manufacturer of stone wool insulation. We offer a diverse range of high performing and sustainable insulation products for uh, really a variety of industries, but it's all based on you know, innovative stone wool technology. And I guess not too long ago, uh, Rockwell actually celebrated 85 years uh, since our founders first produced stone wool in Denmark, which is where we are still headquartered today. And all of our brands really have one common purpose, and that's to 
release the natural power of stone to enrich modern living. And everything we do is organized around that ambition, um, as it really embodies the fact that our stone, uh, that stone really is the core of, of our raw material, and it's the foundation that on which uh, Rockwell really is based. Uh, we have roughly uh, 11,000 employees across 39 countries, and this includes uh, 45 manufacturing facilities. Uh, and within the Rockwell Group, uh, we do have a, an industrial segment, and this is Rockwell Technical Installation, uh, who I'm with. And this is our division that provides solutions for uh, industrial specific applications. So we provide a, a full range of stonewall products with a clear focus on the process and marine and offshore uh, markets. And within, you know, large industrial plants, there are a variety of call it surface profiles that require insulation. You know, these plants require a, a diverse arrangement, I guess, of insulation for the different types of equipment, you know, things like pipes, uh, vessels, columns, tanks, and, and really many more. And hopefully as this graphic shows, uh, Rockwell uh, offers, you know, various uh, diverse solutions that can be used in a range uh, of different applications. You know, there, there is a wide uh, assortment of materials that are used for really a variety of mechanical insulation systems. You know, each material does have its own unique characteristics that make it valuable to different applications. And so hopefully I, I, I want to be clear on this that, you know, there really is no perfect insulation material. You know, there's not a one size uh, fits all. So what's important is that a material is selected that best meets, you know, the system requirements. You know, there, while there are numerous properties uh, to be considered when choosing an insulation, you know, the market really has consistently identified a short list, uh, if you will, of key selection criteria for technical insulation. And these are the critical properties where insulation materials need to perform at a high level to best uh, satisfy design requirements and really contribute to that long-term uh, operational success. But for the purpose of this presentation um, and safety, we're going to focus uh, specifically on water, fire, uh, and acoustics. Uh, we're now uh, going to talk through, you know, the critical challenge of water in industrial plants and how managing various components, you know, of a system can help mitigate the risk of, of CUI. And hopefully, I just, you know, one, one thing before we get into it. I don't want to maybe necessarily beat uh, the dead horse uh, even more to death. I know that this is a topic that a lot of us talk about, but just at a kind of a bird's eye level of, of why it is important and what has you know what has Rockwell done um, in this in this space. So, no mystery. Uh, you know, keeping water out is is not a simple job, right? Um, and water ingress a lot of times cannot be avoided. So, in a plant, you know, water inevitably finds its way into uh, you know the operation critical equipment and piping systems, even those that are covered in insulation. So we always like to think that it will occur regardless of the insulation type, you know, and water in the insulation systems uh, could lead to unanticipated energy loss, downtime, you know, loss of containment, you know, really due to corrosion under insulation or CUI, which, you know, unlike corrosion on a structural steel element, say in a pipe rack, you know, CUI is, call it invisible, you know, to just standard visual inspection. You know, wet insulation material offers reduced insulation performance and water that is trapped, you know, under the insulation or even in the insulation itself, you know, this can cause corrosion of unprotected metal. So it's a very costly problem due to more frequent repairs, shutdowns, overhauls, and just really overall reduction of you know plant service life but even more importantly than that are the potential consequences of uncontrolled uh, corrosion you know that could be catastrophic because that does then have a significant impact or potential significant significant impact on safety and and the environment so you know CUI truly deserves a high level of attention you know and again it, the question is is there a solution well the quick answer again is no there's no one size fits all to completely solve, I guess, the CUI uh, riddle. But from a materials perspective, you know, CUI should be a critical design parameter and it should be monitored and handled 
really throughout the lifetime you know of the equipment um, so the design the choice and the installation of the insulation you know specifically these really need to be optimized so it not only helps to mitigate but also uh, it does not further accelerate the corrosion so uh, why is it critical to quote unquote stay ahead of water uh, in regards to water repellency and wet insulation you know, to no surprise, I'm sure to anybody on the call, uh, wet insulation material offers, you know, really critically reduced performance. Heat loss of the insulation system, it actually can uh, increase eight times when the insulation becomes wet, which is pretty significant, right? Um, but another interesting statistic is how much even the thermal resistance will degrade when it's wet. Um, even with just a very small increase uh, of 5% uh, moisture by volume in the insulation material, this can actually reduce the thermal resistance uh, of insulation by up to 25%, uh, which, is, which is very significant. So how is water repellency actually achieved in a material like stone wool, right, which is a fiber-based material? Is it possible? Well, the water repellency is obtained um, via a combination of the binder that's used in the stone wool um, and what are called water repellent additives. Uh, now, the efficiency and the durability of the water repellency depend on a few things. Uh, the type, the amount, and the way that that additive is actually applied or distributed you know, into, the, into the material. So if an additive is applied early in, say, stone wool manufacturing process, it is possible to actually call it coat each individual uh, fiber uh, and thus get a really uniform distribution um, into the product. So what the additives are doing is they're, they're working by changing the, the surface tension of the stone wool fibers. And what that's doing is it's making it more difficult then for the fibers to actually uh, get wet. Thus, uh, it's, it's delaying, if you will, the penetration of water um, into the stone wool. So, uh, what is Rockwell's response uh, to this challenging topic of, of corrosion under insulation and the need for water repellency in insulation? Well, we developed the, uh, the next generation of stonewall insulation. And this innovation um, is referred to as ProRox with WR Tech, which stands for Water Repellency Technology. And WR Tech essentially is, it's an advanced technology based on a unique binder that repels water. It is a hydrophobic additive that coats, as I mentioned, each individual fiber of the stone wool insulation. Um, and that's done during the production process. So WR Tech is an inorganic uh, resin-based additive. And really this type of water pump additive is, is the superior technology um, on the market. Uh, and I am proud to share that WR Tech is actually an award-winning technology. Um, we were the distinguished uh, recipient of what's called the Materials Performance uh, Corrosion Innovation of the Year Award back in 2019. And what this is, is it's a program that provides a, a forum for what was once NACE, but now uh, AMP. It provides a, a forum for the members and customers to showcase their corrosion mitigation technologies and actually receive recognition for innovative solutions. And winners are actually selected by a panel of, I guess they're called corrosion control experts that really span a, a diverse range of subject matter expertise really from across the industry. And to be considered in a, uh, an innovation, uh, the nominated projects have to show, quote unquote, a significant uh, positive impact in corrosion control. So. WR Tech is actually recognized by industry experts um, in the field of corrosion as a proven technology, which is a superior solution for uh, water repellency and uh, the, the mitigation of CUI uh, potential. And with our uh, continued efforts uh, to improve the performance of insulation materials, especially in applications uh, posing a risk of CUI, uh, I'm very happy to share that Rockwell um, has expanded our innovative uh, WR Tech um, into now our, our ProRox uh, MA960 uh, matte uh, wrap product. So WR Tech was actually first successfully launched in our Mandrawalm pipe sections, where it has demonstrated uh, you know, reliable CUI protection 
uh, sustain thermal resistance and really just to keep uh, plants operating um, at their peak. Um, so owners and EPCs are actually upgrading their specifications uh, to include WR Tech, while contractors and installers are frequently applying this solution to uh, both new build and maintenance projects. So the MA960 with WR Tech uh, is actually suitable for high temperature applications. And if you think of things like large diameter piping and equipment, but also applications where maybe some additional flexibility uh, is required. So this product is now available um, off the shelf and it is uh, as standard in the MA960 uh, blankets now going forward. Okay, so to shift gears, uh, let's let's now dig into the details, I guess, in the danger of fire, uh, specifically describing hydrocarbon fires in industrial plants and why they inflict uh, so much damage and the critical need for protection. And then again, uh, coming around to what is rock will done then, then in this space. So industrial plants um, are very vulnerable, if you will, to fires and these large facilities are exposed to uh, real risk. You know, flammable chemicals and waste products, large equipment and machinery, um, if you think of, you know, the extensive electrical systems, and really just even a large amount of on-site personnel. I mean, all of these things uh, to contribute to a possible uh, fire outbreak. The, the NFPA actually provides statistics on uh, recorded fires every year. Now, to be clear, these are only uh, recorded fires that are, that are uh, recorded to the local fire departments, which I'm not an expert, but from what I understand, industrial facilities are actually not always required to report uh, every fire. So what you see are just in those that were actually reported, um, you know, the municipal fire departments in the U.S. respond to an average of 38,000 fire occurrences at uh, industrial and manufacturing facilities uh, every year. And this approximates to roughly 16 deaths, around 273 injuries, and about $1.2 billion in property damage. So as you can see, uh, fire can result uh, in immense direct um, and indirect costs. Now a simple model for understanding uh, the necessary ingredients for most fires is what's known as the fire triangle. Um, a fire naturally occurs when the elements are present and they're combined in the, in the right mixture. So to prevent or extinguish a fire, you really just simply need to remove any of the one elements in the fire triangle. Now the challenge though is uh, at large industrial facilities, you know, they handle and produce significant amounts of, of flammable materials, which are sources of, uh, of combustion. So to dig a little deeper, um, we, let's, we, we need to understand uh, what's known as hydrocarbon fires. Uh, since hydrocarbons are the chief components of petroleum and uh, natural gas, you know, hydrocarbons often generate you know, significant vapor emissions, uh, really enough to create a flammable concentration. And then when you combine uh, that with oxygen, this really forms a volatile compound. So combustion, uh, or really simply the ability to, to catch fire. The combustion of hydrocarbons um, is the main source of really the world's energy. So in a nutshell, you know, a hydrocarbon fire is, is known as a high intensity fire that's going to spread rapidly. It's going to burn very fiercely and it's going to produce a very high heat flux, um, usually occurring in industrial spaces, you know, like oil and gas facilities. But what what makes hydrocarbon fires so dangerous and how are they different from what we would consider a, a normal fire? Well, hydrocarbon fires are perhaps known for being very hazardous due to that rapid rise in flame temperature as compared to cellulosic fires, which um, that's just another way of saying like wood burning type of fires. Just as a measuring stick of comparison, hydrocarbon pool fires can reach a flame temperature of just over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, it can get there within five minutes, whereas a cellulosic uh, takes roughly around uh, uh, four plus hours. So hydrocarbon fires are further considered highly dangerous compared to uh, fires ignited by simple combustibles 
because the components not only have the capacity to burn on a on a really massive scale, but also potentially activate uh, an explosion if the fluids release if it, if that just cannot be controlled uh, or contained. So hydrocarbon fires are really known as the most severe types of fires, um, just really because they're going to have more disastrous implications for people, you know, the equipment, and really the surrounding um, environment. So uh, you know, hydrocarbon fires really they they give operators and emergency personnel really very little time to to react unfortunately but fire protection uh you know is an essential component of industrial plants you know some some fire safety measures are i guess they're more obvious things like fire alarms or fire extinguishers but as you might expect you know there should be and there typically is more working really behind the scenes as well you know these safety measures are sometimes forgotten about when installing fire protection in a plant, but they are they are crucial. So two terms that typically represent a, a plant's fire protection are what's known as active and passive fire protection. Uh, both of these fire protection measures, they're they're really working in parallel to you know extinguish, suppress, or even prevent the spread of fire. But so what's the difference? You know, very simply put, um, active fire protection requires, think of it like an action or an activation to start working. This can be manual, like a fire extinguisher, or it can actually be automatic, like, like a fire alarm. So this, this action that takes place, it then triggers then the protection. So think of that action happening, and then that triggers the start of maybe like a sprinkler system. Passive fire protection, however, that's something that's always kind of working in, in the background. So it's working to impede the flow of heat or the spread of fire, but does not require um, that activation that I talked about. So this, are, this is something like, you know, an insulation system that's installed on piping. So passive fire protection helps to keep a fire contained, um, really giving more time for it to be extinguished before more damage is caused. So this then allows evacuation and emergency, uh, like the emergency personnel to, to respond. But insulation can be used as a potential solution, which can deliver really reliable uh, fire protection. You know, fire resistance and I guess resilience, if you will, are, are very important um, as the consequences, again, can be very serious. Stone wool specifically uh, helps protect the insulated equipment by reducing that heat transfer and working to contain the fire and prevent it from spreading further. You know, basalt or uh, volcanic rock, um, that is the primary component of stone wool. And very simply, you know, basalt rock is solidified lava, which has formed when rock melts underground and it quickly cools, which rock, um, as imagined, it's naturally fire resistant. So stone wool insulation uh, remains stable at uh, high temperatures and it is a non-combustible material. And again, just to circle back on that term, being non-combustible means that the material does not ignite or burn when exposed to levels of fire or, or heat. Um, importantly as well, stone wool uh, does not contribute to the development or the release of toxic gases. And this is really due to the very low um, organic content uh, of, of the stone wool insulation. Um, and now just looking at, the, you know, uh, maybe most are familiar with uh, this, this ASTM E84. Essentially, it's just a laboratory uh, test that's conducted in a tunnel uh, to determine the surface burning characteristics of an insulation material. And stone wool uh, does have that uh, less than 2550 uh, rating, which is recognized really as the, the best level of safe performance even for indoor uh, applications. But what is rock wool's uh, specific response to the very important topic of passive fire protection needed by industrial facilities? Um, so I'm also excited to announce that uh, rock wool has developed and recently launched a new mandrel wound pipe section solution for this passive fire protection against hydrocarbon pool fires. And we've called the new product uh, PS680 with FRTech. So what does FRTech mean? FRTech stands for fire resistant technology. 
So FR Tech is incorporating uh, an innovative fiber structure in chemistry, really to ensure that mechanical and ke uh, chemical stability during a fire. And these are requirements that are critical for reliable performance. Now, this product has been tested uh, to the industry recognized UL1709 fire curve, and it is providing uh, up to two hours of passive fire protection. So just quickly, the UL1709, um, it's, it's considered the industry standard that is most frequently specified for passive fire protection. And really the purpose or, or the goal, if you will, of this, this standard test method is to evaluate the resistance of protective materials as a system to that rapid temperature rise fire. Now, the UL-1709 was initially actually used for structural steel, but it has been accepted and actually adapted by key oil and gas owners and, and design engineers for the use on process piping um, and equipment. So essentially, again, all this is ensuring that there's ample time for personnel to shut down the flow of the flammable material in the hydrocarbon fire and to prevent uh, the further spread. With that, uh, I am pleased uh, to state, because we get this question, um, yes, uh, this new PS680 material with FR Tech does include the water repellency technology that we talked about. So as you can see, really together in one solution, you're getting a product, uh, like to call it really the difference, the difference between. It is, it's really now optimized to be a, called a physical barrier. Being that difference between, you know, facility failure and proven, protect, uh, proven protection, um, but also to be the difference between uh, elemental threats, you know, such as water, fire, that are posing a risk to, you know, people, the plant, um, and the environment. But I just wanted to make that clear quickly in the slide that um, you get both of these techs in, in one product now. But Rockwell has all, uh, we also do have a slab product um, that can be used for pacifier protection. And we get that question uh, actually quite a lot. Um, and this meets what's known as the requirements of the API uh, 521. And this product is known as SL, SL680, so a slab form. So what API 521 is, is that's a standard that provides guidance, recommendations, and alternatives for the design of what are known as like pressure uh, relieving or vapor depressuring systems. So this is also a common fire standard, but it's more frequently common for like large diameter uh, tanks. So within the API 521 though, there is a requirement that states that the material must function effectively up to, uh, I think it's 1,660 degrees Fahrenheit um, with an exposure uh, uh, for two hours. So, the SL680 is a very similar product with almost identical thermal and physical properties in a flatboard form to that new product that I talked about, the PS680, um, our manager wall and pipe insulation. And it's very similar based on the ingredients and the properties such as density and the chemical uh, makeup. So it, it is, this is suitable for hydrocarbon fire protection on flat surfaces and, and you know, like large diameter vessels and, and tanks. So to, again, to shift the gears to the next topic, um, you know, talking about acoustics and noise, you know, acoustics might not always be considered a, a critical design consideration, but, you know, if you think of pipe work, that is actually representing a significant source of the total noise um, on an industrial site. Therefore, this is clearly a key, key area, you know, it's worth investigating. Um, you know, noise is, is generally considered to be unwanted, annoying, or even the harmful sound. So from a safety perspective, it is, it becomes very important. So industrial plant noise, um, it's normally considered to be loud, you know, and for most of the purposes, you know, it is. This noise uh, can possibly injure an individual directly through noise induced hearing loss, or it can be a factor in long term health, uh, such as stress or heart disease. You know, unless specifically for the good of its purpose, you know, noise really does require the controlling, you know, the reducing or, or actually just eliminating. And I'm sure as most of us um, on the call have experienced, 
you know, industrial processes generate a certain amount of noise and exposure to this noise, it really is, it's very often considered a danger in the workplace. You know, operators, they are expected to take measures to lower noise levels and protect individuals working in these environments and reduce the, you know, the disturbances to even the nearby, you know, residential communities. So the, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, they actually estimate that 22 million U.S. workers, if you're just talking U.S. workers, they're actually exposed to hazardous noise levels every year. So, but in addition to damaging the quality of life, um, occupational hearing loss, it does actually carry a high economic burden as well. You know, roughly $242 million um, is, is, is spent annually on workers' compensation for hearing loss uh, disability, which, which is a big number. You know, OSHA actually governs uh, the health and safety requirements in North America since they are an agency of the Department of Labor. And within OSHA standards, it is stated that if an employer has noise exposure levels that exceed what's known as an action level of 85 decibels for an eight hour shift, a series of health monitoring and recording um, that has to be undertaken and hearing protection is required. Uh, you know, this process requires these work areas and employees to be monitored and recorded, and it does represent a pretty serious undertaking that, you know, it can be time consuming and, and expensive. In addition, there's also uh, what's known as a permissible exposure limit of 90 decibels for an eight hour shift. And that actually is something that it should not even be exceeded. Um, so where this limit is actually exceeded, uh, noise controls should be implemented. So the key takeaway here is that industrial plants, they're all held to complying with health and safety regulations regarding uh, noise exposure. And local legislation exists really to ensure that the site does not exceed, you know, these predetermined noise levels and the penalties can be quite severe if, if those, uh, you know, if those limits are actually violated. So uh, how does piping, I guess, generate uh, noise problems? Uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, you know, the sound emitted by pipework is created by the vibration of that pipework, um, creating an, really an acoustic disturbance in the air that's around it, affecting the areas all around that pipework. So it is the job of, say, insulation to minimize this sound transmission. You know, process piping, it's an important uh, noise source that it needs to be evaluated because it can represent up to 50% of the total noise generated um, on a whole industrial site. But, but why, I guess, why is the pipe work so, so noisy? What is it, what's, what's happening? Well, the pipes are used to transport fluids and they are attached to machinery that drives uh, these fluids, right? Typically these are things like you know, blowers, pumps, compressors. Now the physical structural connection of the pipe to the rotating equipment causes the pipe wall to, to vibrate. And also the action of the fluid flow through the pipe, I mean, that also causes the pipe wall to vibrate. So like the pulsation and the cavitation from the machinery is transmitting uh, through the fluid to the pipe. Additionally, you know, the, the action of like, uh, when you introduce bends or there's rough pipe walls or there's discontinuities, right? So things like pressure gauges, T's or strainers, all of these have an effect on disturbing a smooth fluid flow. And what's happening is these items then are introducing disruptions that cause unsteady flow. Hopefully uh, you can see you know, the, the picture is okay. Essentially, this is demonstrating how discontinuities affect fluid uh, flow, and all of these mechanisms um, can cause the pipe to, to vibrate um, and become a significant sound generator, particularly if the sound generation is in harmony with the uh, what's known as the resonant uh, behavior of the pipe. So, as we know, uh, this pipe vibration causes the, the propagation of the sound uh, via an acoustic wave to the areas that are all around uh, the pipe. So as the pipe itself is vibrating, the application of insulation onto the pipe 
really what that's doing is it's aimed to block uh, that airborne sound. However, uh, it's also very essential to stop the structure-borne sound uh, or noise element from reaching uh, the insulation cladding where what happens is, is then it's actually re-radiated um, as a secondary airborne uh, noise element. So the secret, uh, I guess, to success is typically in an engineered multi-layer insulation system and understanding how component materials are going to behave when they're used together to solve a noise problem. You know, various types of insulation system materials may be used to both, you know, to control both the airborne and the structure-borne uh, noise transmission. You know, absorption and barrier materials will control airborne noise transmission and then damping and isolation or decoupling materials, those will control uh, structure-borne uh, noise transmission. Now, the open porous, I guess, structure of stonewall insulation is effectively absorbing or, or soaking up, if you will, that sound energy waves. Um, and it's really excelling at reducing that propagation of, of noise. So for sound transmission attenuation, Stonewall is ideally working by being kind of absorbing, you know, being soft or limp, but also having a good degree of, of damping. So for the structure-borne uh, transmission attenuation, that high degree of damping, uh, the vibrations, uh, you know, Stonewall's, it has that high degree of damping uh, of those vibrations that's being generated by the turbulent fluid flow that, that we mentioned. So stone wool's, you know, what's what's known as low dynamic stiffness, you know, so this is being uh, non-rigid and being soft and having that optimized airflow resistance. That's what's providing an excellent acoustic absorption across really a, a wide frequency range. So it's necessary to have a material layer that provides a difficult route um, for that sound pressure wave to travel. So it's it loses energy as it passes through it. So most commonly, uh, design specs reference uh, the ISO 15665 regarding acoustic insulation uh, system requirements. And what this is, is it's a, it's a standard that defines what's known as the, assert, uh, the insertion loss, uh, acoustic performance of the pipe insulation, and then it's classifying the material accordingly. Essentially, assertion loss is just the difference um, in decibels of the sound level that's radiated from a noise source before and after you apply, you know, the acoustic uh, insulation system. So to receive a class rating, uh, ISO establishes a specific set of requirements. Um, and the, uh, the system, as a configuration, it must meet uh, at specific octave bands. And this is categorized into classes A, B, C, and then uh, what's known as a shell uh, spec class D. But as, this, as the size of the pipe increases, you know, the more difficult it is to meet the insertion loss requirements uh, of the 15665, and therefore the system design will actually become uh, much more complex. But Rockwell specifically, um, we have various stone wool systems that effectively comply or meet uh, with all of these classifications uh, of the ISO 15665. I guess to shift gears kind of as we come near the end of the presentation, I felt it was important to spend a few minutes and share some insights on the developments that Rockwell has recently taken um, and upcoming to emphasize what, what are we doing to kind of further commit um, to the important North American, North American market. If you're looking at uh, new plant investments um, is our Ranson, West Virginia plant, uh, which Rockwell opened in uh, 2021. It was approximately a $218 million investment that will ultimately create uh, uh, around 150, a little more uh, new jobs in the local economy. And uh, very importantly, this facility actually um, adds roughly 100,000 tons to our capacity in the North America supply chain. So this is enabling, you know, increased domestic production, you know, hopefully shorter lead times and really just overall improved customer service. Primarily, uh, this facility feeds kind of the mid-Atlantic and I would say the Northeast markets, which really have been the quickest to adapt Stonewall in the design of both commercial 
and residential construction. You know, Ranson, it is a state of the art facility in that the, the actual melting furnace is actually powered by natural gas, uh, not coal, which has significantly reduced uh, the CO2 uh, emissions during, during our production. And this plant currently runs, you know, really residential products predominantly, but, but also commercial products. So for those on the call that uh, aren't aware, hopefully you all are, um, Rockwell also opened uh, a, a stocking warehouse in Houston, Texas in 2019. And at this warehouse, uh, we are stocking slabs, pipe sections, um, and the blankets, you know, the mat, hopefully to better serve our, our customer base um, in the South. Uh, and this, this really is the first step in our long-term strategy of growing, I guess, further growing our footprint across the, the US industrial market, really from a supply chain standpoint. So I, I, would, I would really highly encourage you to please reach out to the, I guess, the Rockwell customer service team or your local uh, regional sales uh, manager if you have any questions about uh, the warehouse uh, stocking levels across any of, of the product categories. Uh, Rockwell has uh, also made a large CapEx investment in our Grand Forks facility. Um, our $10 million investment is really to increase the mandrel wound uh, pipe production capacity by about 50%. And this investment and increased production is enabling Rockwell to, you know, hopefully meet the, the growing demand uh, for high quality stone wool, you know, insulation materials in this industrial segments really across all of North America. So just wanted to mention that, you know, some great stuff happening there in this plant and really excited about uh, uh, the future of, of that production. And in the space of call it new product development, um, I'm I'm quite excited uh, to announce that coming very soon, uh, I would I would anticipate around, around late Q1, maybe early Q2 of next year, will be our latest innovation in the Stonewall space for you know CY mitigating solutions. Um, we will be launching a brand new mandrel wound pipe section product that will be called uh, CR Tech. Hopefully you're, you're kind of sensing a theme here with the text. And this stands for corrosion resistant technology. You know, as most of you are already familiar with and that we touched on today, you know, today has been our WR tech, but to build on that innovation and take the, the CUI mitigating characteristics a step further, CR tech uh, will include the WR tech, but now it will also include a corrosion inhibitor um, that is actually deposited on roughly the first uh, five millimeters of the inner of the inner surface of the material. And if you can see it, okay, this is actually represented in the, I guess, fluorescent photo that you see on the slide. So, so again, WR Tech is minimizing the water absorption into the insulation and keeping the system as dry as possible. But in the inevitable event that water finds its way into uh, an insulation system as it, as it does with any material, the CR Tech, you know, uh, this is ready to help neutralize the acidic leachates. So the CR Tech corrosion inhibitor, what it's doing is it's buffering the leachates by making it more alkaline. And then it's essentially uh, forming a protective corrosion mitigating, call it a film or almost a coating that lays down on the outer pipe surface. So CR Tech is a very, I guess, exciting step uh, in the innovation for Rockwell in, in North America. It will further enhance um, uh, Rockwell technical installation in providing solutions that are meeting the demands, you know, of of the industry and our customers, and really to assist uh, Distribution International um, in providing solutions, you know, to your guys' customers uh, who are looking for uh, insulation systems which are uh, helping mitigate CUI. So, I will say that Rockwell is finalizing all of the necessary third-party uh, you know, corrosion, durability, and, and longevity testing that is required to really build that confidence for uh, you know, owners and EPCs that are looking to approve and adopt uh, CR tech into their, into their specifications. And with that, uh, just take a couple minutes to wrap up uh, kind of what we went over today with a summary and, and maybe just a couple key uh, takeaways. 
you know, repelling water and mitigating, you know, CUI. Uh, we talked about the importance of staying ahead of water, right? And that this is a critical challenge for all industrial plants. That water ingress, it, it can occur under every type of insulation system. And if it's not dealt with, you know, in the design phase, managing CUI becomes more risky, dangerous, you know, costly. And insulation materials are an important component that need to be optimized to help mitigate that CUI. So that's where the ProRox with WR Tech, you know, being the first of its kind and really the best kind of in-class uh, solution within within the mineral wool or the stone wool space. Um, it is a durable choice to keep uh, really the plants dry, you know, now and and in the long run. And then impeding, you know, the flow of heat and the spread of fire, you know, as we talked about. Fires are a really significant risk to industrial facilities, especially ones that have hydrocarbons, right? Again, these are fires that are burning much faster than ordinary cellulosic fires, and they're reaching those peak temperatures in, you know, on average in less than five minutes, so very quickly. You know, and passive fire protection is essential for that process safety and critical to piping equipment integrity by just impeding that flow of heat and the spread of fire. So this is where our new ProRox with FR Tech, you know, is optimal as a passive fire protection solution. So it's a cost-effective system approach to those hydrocarbon pool fires, again, providing up to two hours of passive fire protection. And then lastly, again, reducing, uh, you know, those harmful noise levels. You know, for heavy industrial facilities, the impact of noise is an important issue. And it is a significant source, um, you know, it's often that piping radiated noise. So whether it's a problem of occupational noise exposure risk or just compliance with environmental noise regulations, you know, noise needs to be reduced um, or, or controlled. So our ProRox product line, you know, includes various acoustic stone wool based solutions that do help those noise level, those noise levels of industrial, you know, pipe in accordance with, as I mentioned, that ISO that ISO standard, really meeting all the classifications for for insertion loss. You know, while while plant owners, you know, can't avoid every potential issue, you know, with the insulation systems in their plant, you know, they can increase the resistance, I guess, and the resilience of the important assets. So, proven water repellency, fire resistance, and noise reduction. They are all key components, you know, for that success. So ultimately, by selecting proven insulation systems that provide, you know, a high performing barrier from those dangerous threats, you know, that that pose, you know, a risk now, but also a, a hidden risk, uh, hidden risk later. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I, I would really like to, you know, thank you all so much for joining today. And being a part of the webinar, I would like to thank you know DI for and Jared for being such a great host. You know, I really hope that the information was valuable um, and that it is helpful in I guess the future insulation I guess decision making. You see my contact information uh, here on the screen. I mean, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. You know, even just to coordinate a, a lunch and learn at your office or with or with your clients. I mean, this is something that. I really enjoy doing and having that face-to-face -face discussion. I, I feel it is very helpful to just better understand how Rock will ultimately we want to be a, a better partner and, and and provide better support for your business with with our products. Yeah, and I guess for for those of you that submitted questions uh, during the webinar, I'll, I'll I'll pass it back over to to Jared and, and we'll, we'll take a peek if if there's some questions that came in. Happy to do my best to, to answer them. Yeah, Jared. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate your time today. Uh, very informative. I re really appreciate it. We don't have any questions in yet, but uh, while we're waiting on some questions to come in, I do want to um, remind uh, our audience that DI as a um, distributor offers this webinar as a way for our manufacturing partners to inform customers about their products. So, um, you know, we we offer this platform to to all our manufacturing partners, and I also want to take a second to plug our um, our amazing website, uh, distributioninternational.com. It's an amazing resource that has a wide range of value added features, including our customer portal, which we call Customer Connect. Um, when you are logged in as a DI customer, you can view past invoices, uh, access pricing, request quotes, and even submit orders all right there online. Um, maybe the best feature. But the website is detailed uh, online product catalog of more than 30,000 products. It's easy, easy to search and easy to navigate. 
uh, go to distributioninternational.com today, register your online account if you haven't done so. I uh, also want to remind everybody that we do record these webinars and we will post them on our YouTube channel um, and, and also follow us on LinkedIn for future webinar, um, webinar announcements as well. Uh, we still don't have any questions. Um, that must mean you did such a great job, Jack, and answered everything during your, during your presentation. So uh, we thank you for your time and um, look forward to having Rockwell back as a guest on another webinar in the future. Excellent. Thanks again, Jared, and, and to the DI organization. We really appreciate the, the time and, and being a great host. Yeah, this is, this is great. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.